Apple II wire-by-wire -wire build, memory mapped I.O. I'm Dr. Matt Regan. Early in the playlist, I went over the concept of memory mapping. The 6502 has 16 address pins, which means it can address 2 to the power of 16 locations. That's the equivalent of 65,536 of these little pigeonholes, and collectively, they're known as the address space. Everything the 6502 talks to has to be mapped to one or several locations in the address space. The vast majority of the address space is taken up by ROM and RAM. Remember that the ROM is the permanent storage and it's read only, whereas the RAM loses its content when the power goes off, but we can read and write to this memory. On the Apple II, there's only a small slither of address space set aside for input and output devices, such as the keyboard and the floppy disks. This space is located between C000 hex and C0FF hex. I'll often write this as C0XX, but I'll refer to it as the C1000 page. And the main reason I'm doing that is so that YouTube doesn't get the wrong idea about this video. If you cast your mind back to some of the early videos I made in the series, you'll remember that I made some special hardware for detecting the C1000 page. This consisted of six inverters and an eight input NAND gate. Now the way it's wired, the output will go low when the upper byte of the address bus contains the value C0, otherwise it'll be high. Even though I've already built this, I haven't documented it in the schematic diagram, so I'll do that now. I'm going to connect the chips the way I did on the board, but it looks a bit silly on the schematic diagram. But it does make sense if you look at the board itself. Label all the signals. I'm going to reorder the position of the inverters. Now this is completely unnecessary from a functional perspective, but it makes the schematic easy to look at. It's already starting to look better. The upper two bits go directly to the NAND gate, and the whole thing is connected to the address bus. Label the output. It was at about this point in time when I realized that this whole circuit wouldn't work when video was running. Previously, when the Arduino was doing I.O., I could stop the clock and the values on the address bus would remain stable. But with the video circuit working, the address bus will contain video data half the time even if the CPU is halted. I'm going to need another octal D-type flip-flop to capture the lower bits of the address bus when the CPU is writing to it. That way, the Arduino can be sure it's reading a CPU address for AIO and not a video address. The way I'm going to do this is to put another 74HC374 in the circuit with the outputs driving the F port on the Arduino, while the inputs are connected to the lower bits of the address bus. Now, there's already another 374 connected to this port, so I need to be careful that they're never both on at the same time. This is where we're up to in the build to date. First, I need to move this reset switch. I need this part of the board to place the new 74HC374 I'm going to add to the circuit. This switch is being a bit stubborn. All right, that's got it free. After that, I need to solder in a socket for the new chip. Connect it to the power and ground rails and solder in a decoupling capacitor. Sometimes it can be a bit tricky soldering from underneath a chip because you need to flip the pin out in your head. Pin 1 is on the upper right when viewed from below. Here, I've initially soldered ground to pin 11 instead of pin 10, so I'll need to fix that. I also need to solder ground back up to the reset switch. Excellent. Now we get to the meat of this build. I want to connect all of the output wires from the upper 74HC374 to all the output wires of the lower 74HC374, which are already connected up to the Arduino Mega. So I need to connect pin 2 to pin 2, pin 5 to pin 5, and all the way around the chips for the outputs of the 374. What I want to do is multiplex the output of these two 74HC374s 
To save pins on the Mega itself, I still have about a dozen lines free on the Mega, but I don't want to use up eight of them on this. And really, it's okay if the Mega can only read the latch data bus or the lower bits of the address bus one at a time. Look there, I've just formed a solder bridge. I'll need to get rid of that before I can move forward. That looks better now. I'm using the term latch and flip flop interchangeably a bit here, but these are all actually flip flops. However, when a register or flip flop holds a value, we sometimes say the value's been latched in. Any ideas why I don't need to latch the upper address bits? Thoughts? Comments? Well, the answer is that I already know the upper address bits must contain C0 hex in order for the state machine to assert the ready signal on the 65 CO2. So I don't need to latch it when I already know what it is. This is where having double loops around the pin on the initial solder really helps. I can reflow the solder on the pin and the wire connected to it won't move. This means I can solder the new wire directly onto it. But from now on I may have a problem. And that's because the new wire is only mechanically secured by the solder itself. So if I reflow the solder, the new connection will often come loose. So again, I probably should have thought of this a bit earlier. But solving your own mess ups is half the fun. Now it's getting a bit tight to get at these buried pins. I could probably use a smaller soldering iron here, but I want to continue using this 25 water. Mainly to show that it can be done. The input to this new 374 that I've put in place come from the address bus, specifically lines A0 through A7. Now I could have tapped these off the Arduino, but they're actually packed in really tight. Well, tightly is probably actually the correct adverb. So instead, I'm going to tap into the address lines on the EEPROM. There's just a little bit more space there, and it just makes things a little bit easier. Once I've finished wiring up these eight address lines, I'm going to need to work on the output enable for the two 374s that are wired up in parallel. Now, it's up to me to make sure that they're never turned on at the same time. Otherwise, we'll get output contention, and we've seen before how much of a problem that can be. But I think the easiest way is just to wire the output enable directly up to some spare pins on the Arduino. But it means it's going to be up to the software not to make the error of turning them both on at the same time. One of the problems with the Arduino is that we don't know how long it's going to take to service a C1000 address request. Fortunately, the 6502 has a ready signal. A negative transition to the low state prior to the falling edge of clock will halt the microprocessor with the output address lines reflecting the current address being fetched. So what I need is a little state machine to manage ready. In state zero, ready will be high, and provided we don't see a C1000 address, it'll just stay in this state. But if our C1000 bar signal goes low, then we know we've hit a C1000 address, and we transition to state one. In state one, we set ready low, this halts the CPU, and we stay in this state until the Arduino tells us to go back to the other state, which is the run state. I'm going to call S0 my current state, and S0 bar is actually the ready signal. Given our C1000 signal, our signal from the Arduino, and our current state, we can compute what the next state should be. In state 0, if C1000 signal is high, then we stay in state 0. Otherwise, if C1000 signal is low, we go to state 1. Then in state 1, if the Arduino signal is low, we stay in state 1. But when the Arduino signal goes high, we go back to state 0. To figure out the logic to encode this, we can use a Carnot map. Now, I went over Carnot maps in video 9. First thing I'd need to do is copy the contents of the state transition table into the Carnot map. I can identify these two loops, and we can make a single loop with an AND gate, and then we OR all of the AND gates together to get our final signal. You'll notice on the lower AND gate that I need the inverse of our C1000 bar signal. The inverse of C1000 bar is just C1000. If this is new to you, it might be worth going over video 9 again and having a look. I have my next state logic for the state machine. Now I need to hook up the flip-flop to store the state. 
For this, I'm going to use a 74HC74, which just contains two D-type flip-flops, and these flip-flops are triggered on the positive edge of their clock signal. We only need one of these flip-flops because we only have one state variable, which is S0, and we want the 6502 to be halted in state 1 when S0 is 1. But the CPU is halted when ready is low, so instead we can use S0 bar to halt the CPU. But now we have another problem. The ready signal is actually bidirectional, which means that it can be driven or the microprocessor can drive it. To stop things getting ugly, we're going to need a current limiting resistor between S0 bar and the ready signal. That way, if both the flip flop and the 6502 itself are driving the ready signal, we'll limit the current draw. If we go back to our clock diagram, the video memory has access while clock's low and the 65CO2 has access while clock's high, but the ready signal is sampled on the falling edge of clock. So we're going to want our state machine to be updated sometime after the rising edge of clock and sometime before the falling edge of clock. If I put our state machine clock about 90 degrees out of phase with the main clock, then that'll give our C1000 logic and our next state logic time to settle before we need it. It also means the ready signal will be set up well before the 6502 reads it. If I clock these lower flip-flops at our 14 MHz rate, then each flip-flop should delay the CPU clock by 70 nanoseconds. Generally, the CPU clock is high for six of these 14 MHz cycles, so delaying it by three clocks seems to make sense. If we check the setup time for the ready signal on the 65CO2, we can see that we're well within the limits. I'm going to go with this circuit, so let me add it to the schematic diagram. There is one potential problem with this state machine. The Arduino sends a control signal high to go from state 1 back to state 0, but we assume that it can send it back to 0 before the next C1000 page request comes in. This might be a problem for read, modify, write instructions, but I think the Arduino is up to the task. I'm going to build our little state machine up on the top left, but while I do, let me talk about what we've got left to do. Once the ready circuit works and I can reliably halt the CPU for C1000 reads and writes, I can get the video mode switching to work. At the moment, video mode is hardwired into text or high res mode. After that, I need to add the floppy disk interface. Now I'm not going to use an actual floppy drive. I'm going to connect an SD micro card to the Arduino Mega. There's plenty of software out there on the internet for communicating with an SD card. Connecting up a keyboard will be next after that. There are quite a few good videos on YouTube at the moment for doing that. A couple from Ben Eder and one from Dr. Volt. I haven't looked at it in detail yet, but I think I'll get away with just using one chip for the interface. Long term, I plan to keep the Arduino Mega for the keyboard and floppy drive interface. In fact, this was the main reason for selecting the Mega. I want to get color to work properly, which means I'm going to need to reprogram the raster generator to include the color burst signal and to increase the width of the scan line by two clocks. I'll need to wire in the color burst hardware, and I think I'll stick pretty closely to Steve Wozniak's design for the Apple II. All right, back to the build. Power and ground are in place for all the chips that I've just added. I'm going to tie high the set and clear to the flip flop. The D input comes from the OR gate next to it. This is an OR of AND's circuit, so the input to the OR gates comes from the output of some AND gates. This is pretty much how we wire up circuits from Carnot maps. Each loop is an AND gate, and we combine the loops with an OR gate. Now we need the current limiting resistor for the ready signal. Connect up the signal from the Arduino. This goes to one AND gate, and the inverted signal goes to the other gate. The C1000 page signal out of our NAND gate is active low, but it just so happens that our ready state machine needs it to be active high. No problem, I just invert it. I want to put our state machine clock out of phase with our CPU clock. And on the previous diagram, I had three flip flops clocked at 14 MHz. But instead of using the 74HC74, I'm going to use the 74HC174, which is a hex D type flip flop with a common clock. 
the clocks connected to our 14 MHz crystal oscillator. So let me just build the circuit for that. The reason I've chosen to use this chip is that apart from these three flip-flops, I'm going to need another flip-flop elsewhere in the circuit also clocked at 14 MHz. Anyone want to take a crack at why I'm going to need this extra flip-flop? Leave comments below. All will be revealed in an upcoming video. Speaking of which, we're getting near the end of this series, so if you have any requests, just leave them in the comments. I'm not going to do the bring up for this circuit in this video. I'd rather save it for when I'm trying to bring up either the keyboard or the disk drive. So I'll save that for next video. It just makes more sense to try and get the I.O. circuit to work with an actual I.O. device. I've only got a few more things to connect up. This is the ready signal to the CPU. I need to connect the SATE machine up to the Arduino so it can release the hold on ready when it wants to. I also need to connect up the ready signal to the Arduino so the Arduino knows when there's a pending request. The 74HC174 has a reset input, so I'm just going to tie that high through a resistor, and after that I think we're done. This should be the last big build of the entire series. From now on it'll be mainly bring-ups. I salute you for getting so far into the series. And if you haven't already, like, share, and subscribe.